on Earth, the great burst of life during the Cambrian explosion was an integral step on the path to intelligence. But could widespread death have been just as important? Einstein said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Well, it seems that he does. And there's a whole lot of dice going on in the evolution of life. Paleontologist Peter Ward is an expert on mass extinctions, the catastrophic changes of fortune in the game of life, when the majority of animals lose and just a few inherit the Earth. This is a mammal-like reptile actually called a Gorgonopsian, or a Gorgon. It was the biggest and baddest carnivore of the late Permian 252 million years ago, and this is a baby. The big ones were three meters to four meters long, very large skulls, crossed between a lion and a big saltwater crocodile, if you will, half reptilian, half mammal, all nightmare. These guys all died out in the Permian extinction 252 million years ago. Its entire group gone. The Permian extinction was the most devastating of the five mass extinction events in Earth's history. Experts believe an intense surge of volcanic activity led to dropping sea levels, acid rain, and poisoning of the atmosphere. More than 95% of marine life and over two-thirds of terrestrial animals were completely wiped out, resetting the stage for the evolution of life on our planet. The Permian extinction did far more than just the top carnivore. It took out the herbivores, it took out most of the plants, it took out the insects, the amphibians. But what did get through were a couple small reptilian groups, real small in size. Like pruning a rose, cutting back the tree of life gives rise to rapid growth as new branches reach out their leaves to the light. With little competition or threat from predators, surviving species adapt quickly to fill the gaps left behind. The tiny reptiles that survived the Permian extinction grew into hundreds of different species, including dinosaurs, who ruled the Earth for over 100 million years until their own date with disaster arrived. I mean, that was a very rapid and hideous death. Probably every dinosaur dead within three to six months max. That was a line in the sand. Who wins? Well, who won are the small creatures. The T. rexes die out and tiny mammals get through and then they develop into all of the kinds of mammals we see today. And they did so really fast. The size of the skull of the animal that gave rise to us was the size of a robin egg or smaller. Might the evolutionary branch that led to us never have grown had it not been for the random impact of an asteroid 65 million years ago? I would support the idea that, in fact, if we still had not had the impact, something else might be running around as intelligent, but I, I doubt it would be in this form and this set of behaviors that we humans have. If our own existence is the outcome of a random cosmic disaster, then might the fraction of worlds that evolve intelligence be equally unpredictable? But if we could go looking for alien intelligence on another planet, how would we recognize it? Well, I think the method of looking for complex behavior on a different planet is to do what behavioral scientists do. You look, you observe, you see how animals move, how they respond to stimuli, how they act. As a biologist who does this regularly, I find that extremely exciting because the discovery quotient would be very high, but it would also be weird and alien. I sort of like weird and alien, so I think that would be a lot of fun. Professor Roger Hanlon is an expert on the closest thing to alien intelligence on Earth. 
cephalopods, squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. The undisputed masters of disguise, because they have to be. Cephalopods are soft-bodied. All their armor was given away through evolutionary time to their cousins, the oysters and the clams, and they are soft-bodied. They're extremely vulnerable. So they have to get on by their wits. They have to do something different. They're making that decision in far less than one second. In about one third of one second, they're assessing that visual scene. Now they're orchestrating in their skin 30 million chromatophore pigment organs in the skin that create the pattern and iridescent reflective cells and even the skin papillae and the bumps, there are several thousand of those. So that takes a lot of cognitive processing, a lot of brain power. Cephalopods have the highest brain to body mass ratio of all invertebrates. And their brains are decentralized, meaning neural tissue is distributed throughout their body. Having split from our own group, vertebrates, well before the Cambrian explosion, they are the product of an entirely separate experiment in the evolution of intelligence. If you look at the evolutionary history of complex behavior, we know about vertebrates and humans and primates and all the rest. But through evolutionary time, there's only one group that has branched off to produce really complex behavior, and it's these animals, the squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. So what we expect is for the white square to show up in the white head bar. The white head bar is already there. And now it's changing its pattern a little more. It's blanched a little bit. You can see these two markings down here, but we're looking for that white square to appear. And it's coming. So I think the correlation you might make for looking for extraterrestrial intelligence would be don't expect anything like humans or dogs and cats and all the things we're used to. Here underwater, you have this weird octopus with its head on its feet and distributed brain, but they're doing complex things. We might find something very similar in a different planet. It might be a different size, a different shape, and its form of intelligence may be different as well. So I think we have to open our minds and recognize the diversity on this planet to set the stage and the framework for going to other planets to look for life forms and intelligence. <laughs>